Uh, greetings, and welcome to, I believe this is the 31st episode of Modern Audio Interviews. And uh, today, uh, we have uh, Murlord, the author of the uh, relatively popular new mod, uh, Frostwind, and also several other mods, like I think it's uh, A Most of Alcoholism and uh, The Brewmaster, amongst others. So, uh, first things first, I'd like to uh, thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me today. Thanks, it's great to be here. So we're just going to go ahead and start out with a few basic intro questions, uh, the uh, first of which is, uh, when did you first start playing Morrowind and the Elder Scrolls in general? Um, so Morrowind came out, what, 16 years ago, I would have been 12 years old, and um, I mostly watched my older brother play it, but I probably started playing back then. I don't know if I ever got past Satanine when I was 12, so yeah, I've, I've been playing it pretty much since it first came out. Oh yeah, that's about the uh, same as me, really. Uh, it's been a pretty long time. I don't think I finished the main quest for like two or three years after, you know, Marwin came out. <laughs> I didn't complete the main quest until last year, actually. Oh, good heavens, that's got to be a new record. <laughs> yeah, well, I have uh, chronic restart itis, so I've played many, many games, but it wasn't until last year that I actually powered through and beat the main quest. Oh yeah, that is a question I want to ask. Uh, are you more of a uh, role player? You know, someone who plays a particular character and, you know, doesn't just stick to a particular set of skills or something? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I used to play role playing games more like min-maxing, but then when I started um, playing more, you know, role playing and sticking to the character and making choices based on what the character would do, I found it was way more fun. So now I'm, I'm very strict about that. I always play as a, you know, with a strict role-playing kind of sense. Now, I guess that sort of ties into the whole, you know, immersion mod uh, concept that you do then too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I'm, basically, I make mods for myself. When I start a game and I have an idea of a character I want to play, and I see that there's like a lack of game mechanics around the, that sort of play style, I'll just go and make myself a mod. It's um, like the immersive alcohol I made because I wanted to make a, a drunken alcoholic character, you know? Oh yeah, that makes sense. And I was actually going to ask uh, next, uh, what was your first mod and how did you get the idea for it? Uh, was there something uh, in particular, like the uh, immersive alcohol thing? Yeah, so the, <clears throat> the first mod um, that I got into was uh, my Bardic Inspiration mod, where you perform um, your loot in taverns. And that came about because I'd, I'd been playing a game of Dungeons & Dragons at work and I had a bard character, and I just, I was totally into bards at that point. And so I thought, like, I wondered whether Morrowind had a a bard kind of mod where I could roleplay as a bard. And there's a few, but none of them quite did what I wanted. So I ended up um, just editing uh, Zar's Better Loots 3 mod. Just I just wanted to fix some bugs in that mod, but I ended up rewriting the whole thing. Oh yeah, the uh, the bard uh, mods I typically think of when I think of a bard mod is, you know, uh, Danae's A Bard's Life, I think it is, or uh, something like that. Yeah, her, her Bard's Life is mod is really awesome, um, but it's more sort of, it's very, um, kind of changes the game quite a bit, whereas what I really wanted in my mod was just something, just a little extra immersion to help, um, to help make you feel like a bard, you know, as opposed to changing the gameplay. And actually that's why I beat the game for the first time last year was because of that Bardic Inspiration mod I made. That was the extra little kick I needed to be invested in my character. Well, moving on to this uh, next question here. Uh, what draws you to uh, modding video games? Well, like I said, I make mods for myself. Um, I think you know, I make mods to make the game more fun for me to play. Uh, of course, then you know, I, I tend to get carried away with the modding and I don't have much time to play the game itself. No, oh, yeah, I think that kind of happens to basically every modder out there. I mean, who really plays the game anymore? Uh, the CS is just so much more appealing. Oh, yeah, I love the uh, the mechanics where the scripts don't work. Oh, yes, yeah, so, uh, Morrowind's notorious uh, script compiler just uh, strikes again, and you have to just go through and rewrite everything. Isn't that always just a lot of fun? Oh, I love spending an entire weekend trying to fix a bug that was caused by a lack of spaces between brackets. And, uh, you know, that actually brings me to our next set of questions here. Uh, we're going to move on to some of our more specific questions, and the first one is from Otto Clark. Uh, what was the uh, biggest challenge in making Frostwind? And it kind of sounds like it's the scripting here. Um, yeah, so trying to fix bugs in um, the scripts was definitely a big part of it, especially when the uh, initially I pretty much had all the logic in a single thousand-line script. 
Um, but when I started Frostwind, my assumption was the difficulty would be in detecting all the events I would need, like the weather and you know, um, and what region you're in, and that turned out to be the easy part. Um, but I, I'd say the main difficulty in making Frostwind was balancing it all, because you have all of these different um, things that affect the weather, and you need to balance that for every kind of player, every level, you know, whether they're um, they're wearing their player te their character tends to wear heavy armor, or whether they're you know um, going to spend a lot of time in cold areas. It's very hard to balance it for all the different play styles out there. Oh yeah, I can imagine. And uh, I actually kind of wanted to ask, uh, how many lines of code did Frostwind end up being exactly? Lines of code? Um, so the main Frostwind script is sitting at 700 lines of code, but that's because I've refactored out a whole bunch of the code into different scripts. So I've now got over 23 scripts in the, in the mod, um, but none of them quite as big as that main 700 line one. So I, I would say at least 1,500 lines of code in total. Ah, oh, good heavens, that sounds like a, quite the endeavor. Uh, how long did that take you exactly? Um, it's been a few months. Um, pretty much every single weekend and most afternoons for the past three or four months. I'm not sure exactly how long. Well, I have to say, it came out pretty well. I mean, uh, the current Frostwind is probably the most immersive uh, weather mod uh, and temperature mod for Morrowind. Oh, thanks. Um, well, it was a bit of a rush trying to get it out in time for the modathon, especially with me going overseas for the last two weeks of the month. Oh yeah, I can imagine, and uh, now it is probably uh, one of the favourites to win this year's uh, modathon mod of the month, though uh, th you have a lot of competition, so we'll have to see. Yeah, some really good mods came out in the last week. Makes me a bit worried. <laughs> oh yeah, and actually on a similar note, I want to ask, uh, were there other... Uh, were there any other uh, Modathon mods that uh, had your attention during the competition? Um, well, so far my favourite has been um, the uh, the Poison mod by, um, was it Greatness, I think? Um, that was really awesome because I remember like way back when I used to play Morrowind, the thing I always wished it had was the ability to use the Poison you know, negative effects of potions. So that's just been amazing coming out. Oh yes, and that's a uh, pretty big deal too, because uh, as I recall, I think Oblivion and Skyrim, you know, have the ability to use poisons, like to uh, poison arrows and things. It was never something you could do in Morrowind, it was just a useless potion that you can do anything with. Yeah, and poisons were some of the, the um, most fun parts of, like, Oblivion. Um, I remember you could stick a poison, you could reverse pickpocket a poison apple into someone's pocket and then they'll eat it and die which I thought was hilarious. It'd be cool if we could get something like that in Morrowind as well. Yeah, probably one of the only things that Oblivion did better than Morrowind. <laughs> yep, that's true. And uh, anyway, I wanted to ask, are there any new features and or mechanics that you're planning to add in the future for uh, Frostwind? Uh, yeah, I've got um, a number of features planned um, for Frostwind, uh, especially once I adopt the script extender into it. Um, so I'm planning on things like having dedicated hotkeys for crafting, as opposed to these, you know, right now you just have a book that you have to hotkey. Uh, but that uses up, you know, your space for items and clothing. So it'd be good to have a, a separate hotkey for that. Um, with the script extender as well, I'll be able to include um, clothing, my regular clothing, and calculating the warmth of the character. And um, something I've been discussing with uh, CPT Joker, um, who might help collaborate with this, is actually um, instead of the fade to black mechanic when you're chopping firewood, actually going around and chopping trees, um, you know, detecting if the player is nearby an actual tree and using the attack animation to chop down firewood. Yeah, that kind of sounds like it would be pretty difficult to do without some sort of script attached to the actual trees. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how we'll do it yet, but um, it'll be an interesting challenge. That's half the fun of it, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of attempts to try and, you know, do that whole firewood collecting thing. In the past, I think Moan Modding Crafting, uh, did they add a bunch of just extra trees to like the Bitter Coast or something? I think that's what they did. Um, the the only mod I've played that's done something like that, um, I can't remember what it was called, but they basically added tree stumps around the world that you interact with. Oh yeah, I think that's the uh, the one I'm thinking of, and it's not exactly the most immersive element. It's like you can only get uh, wood from tree stumps and not from the actual trees that are all around you. Yeah, so hopefully with um, with 
the new you know features coming to the Morrowind script extender and Lua scripting and stuff like that. Um, hopefully now we'll have the ability to make it much more immersive and fun. Well, uh, speaking of that, uh, in the uh, Null Cascade interview, which airs on Sunday, uh, Null mentioned that uh, starting in uh, MWSC 2.2, it would be possible to add uh, new UI elements to the game, so things like a temperature gauge and exposure rating uh, could be graphically added to the user interface. Uh, do you think that's uh, something you'd be interested in creating an add-on for, uh, with Frostwind in that vein once you know MWSC 2.2 is released? Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Um, I'm kind of... <laughs> I'm kind of proud of the solution I came up with, with you know the limitations of vanilla Morrowind, um, where it has a message box that gives you, you know, quick information about your exposure and the weather and stuff. But if when we can actually do you know UI stuff, um, yeah, definitely that'll be much better. Oh yeah, the the uh, sort of auto timer updates on your exposure was a really good idea, and you know helps keep the character informed despite the lack of you know. A UI implementation. Yeah, I quite like it. I, I try and make my mods as um, as unintrusive as possible. You know, if you're not if you're not currently um, you know actively engaged in the mod mechanics, it shouldn't get in the way of you know the rest of your playthrough. Oh yeah, definitely. Though you know the exposure rating and temperature gauge thing would definitely be useful, even if it does clutter up the uh, UI a bit more. Yeah, I think um, if I were to do a UI thing, I would try and make it um, responsive. So rather than always being at the top, sitting there showing you your exposure, um, it would um, only show up when when you need to know that information. You know, when the temperature changes or maybe every couple of minutes. Um, yeah, rather than just always being there. Oh yeah, I think there's a few survival games on uh, Steam that do a sort of similar thing, like the... Uh, the uh, the one I've been playing is the uh, Long Dark, and it does something uh, pretty much a lot like that. Yeah, games like the Long Dark are a big inspiration for me. Um, like my ideal game would be something as as difficult and and you know harsh as a survival game like the Long Dark, but set in a you know fantasy RPG setting. Oh yeah, that would be really interesting. And I don't know, has anyone actually sort of pulled that sort of thing off before? Uh, the closest I can think of um, is not a fantasy setting, but there is a mod for Fallout 3, I think it is, or Fallout 4, that totally um, redoes the game and makes it incredibly harsh. Like, going outside for more than five minutes, you you know, you need a gas mask and things like that. So it's, it's about the closest I can think of in terms of the really hardcore survival mechanics. Yeah, that reminds me of, uh, what was it, uh, Metro 2033 or something like that? That was uh, sort of similar. Yeah, um, I played that up until the bit where you go to the surface and you're fighting hundreds and hundreds of monsters, so yeah, it's pretty close. Well, since we're on the topic anyway, uh, what were your biggest inspirations uh, for Frostwind? Uh, well, the obvious one is um, Skyrim's Frostfall, um, which is absolutely my favourite mod for Skyrim. Um, Un unmodded Skyrim just isn't really fun for me. I think they do a lot of things, a lot of things um, poorly in terms of gameplay mechanics. So a, a mod like Frostfall really, um, really improved it and made it more fun to play. Um, so yeah, it's pretty obvious that Frostwind is, you know, a, an attempt to recreate that in Morrowind. Uh, other than that, um, yeah, what other mods have inspired me? Um, yeah, I think that's about it for Frostwind, specifically. Oh, yeah, well then, I may as well ask, is there anything that's inspired your uh, other mods? So, I suppose my biggest inspiration for my immersion-style mods would be um, the, the old-school games that really did um, did sort of those mechanics really well. Like, um, one of my favourite games is Dwarf Fortress, and the reason for that is because of the way that the world reacts to the user's actions. And I think that's really important for role playing is when, when you make a decision as your character, the world needs to respond, it, you know, in kind. So games like yeah, uh, Dwarf Fortress and Minecraft, uh, that have really reactive worlds is a huge inspiration for me. Oh yes, I've uh, heard Dwarf Fortress mentioned a lot in these past interviews. I think, oh gosh, was it Superstar uh, who mentioned that as an inspiration at one point? Yeah, it's just it's it's such an amazing game and. Uh, it's something that really can only be done with, you know, really, like, 
the ASCII graphics and stuff is um, is what allows the game to have so much content in it, you know. And that's sort of what makes Morrowind um, for a lot of people more enjoyable than Skyrim and Oblivion is that the um, the limited graphics and you know voice acting and stuff actually allows for more content to be made for it. Oh yes, I think that was I think. Uh... Someone else has mentioned that before, is that it is a bit harder to make content for the newer Elder Scrolls games because of the increased graphical standards, whereas with Morrowind, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about getting those models quite up to the uh, latest graphics. Yeah, and unfortunately it's a trend that's going to continue because, you know, AAA game studios, they, they feel like they have to make more visually impressive games um, as time goes on, but... Man, just imagine how great it would be if a AAA studio decided to make, you know, a a classic style game with dumbed down graphics. Um, imagine how much content they could put into that if they were to remake something like Morrowind without upping the graphics. Oh yeah, and uh, use uh, text dialogue instead of voice dialogue because I think I read somewhere that like uh, half of Skyrim, the data on the disc was actually just voice dialogue lines. So just imagine. What more they could do if they didn't have that particular limitation? Yeah, and you don't need to completely get rid of it either. If you look at a game like um, you know, Fallout 1, how old that game is, it has a lot of voice acting in it. But because they just um, they do it in such a way that you only get the voice acting when you need to, there's still a whole lot of dialogue and you know, branching options and stuff in that game. Yeah, and you don't have to uh, dumb it down to uh, that the uh, dialogue is minimal. Yeah, I mean, the moment you start voice acting every single line of dialogue, um, immediately you're, you're forced to reduce the number of questing, uh, sorry, branching quests and, you know, different options because the moment you have, you know, the player has to make a choice, you've doubled the amount of dialogue from that point on. Um, so it, it just immediately um, forces the developer to make the game more linear. Which is, you know, kind of a problem I have with role-playing games, because the idea of a role-playing game is that you have choice. You eliminate choice, and it's not really a role-playing game anymore. It's more like a roller coaster. Yeah, I mean, RPG games, they're all just poor approximations of Dungeons & Dragons at the end of the day, you know? In Dungeons & Dragons, you can literally do whatever you want. You can make any kind of character you want and play the game however you want, and that's where the fun comes from, you know? you. You play as your own unique character that you have created, and you see the world react to your actions. And video games, you know, role-playing games are supposed to be trying to emulate that. And unfortunately, with the, the way that games are going, it's, it's moving away from that freedom um, just because of the limitations brought on by these modern graphics. Uh, yeah, that is kind of unfortunate. I have noticed this trend where I'll, you know, watch the uh, Bethesda E3 uh, conference and all the other E3 conferences and be like, well, I'm not really interested in any of this. And so I just go back to Morrowind. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's like in Fallout 4, you, you know, the main quest, you finally meet your son and you can't just shoot him in the face. Like, even if your character is completely morally opposed to him, they didn't include an option for you to straight up, you know, go against them. And that's just a symptom of this of this path that games are taking now. Um, and that's why, um, that's why I make immersion mods for Morrowind, is to try and bring Morrowind closer to Dungeons & Dragons style freedom. And that is definitely a worthy goal. And can I just say, just a bit of a rant here, it's like, oh my gosh, Fault 4, with the whole voice dialogue for your character is just a terribly bad idea. I mean, I mean that just limits role-playing even more. Yeah, weren't they saying they spent like four years just recording that dialogue, and they never thought like, maybe that's not a good idea? Like, what are they going to do next time? They've now set a precedent where they voice the main character, and if it takes four years just to voice... Like, you, you can't... No amount of technology can improve that timeline. If you make a game that big, it's going to take four years to voice the character. It's it's unsustainable, you know? Oh, yes, and it gets especially difficult when you talk about the next Elder Scrolls games. So you have, what, like ten races to choose from? What, do you record a separate voice for each of those ten races? That then has to, you know, that you play as and do all these quest interactions? That's ridiculous. Yeah, I think Skyrim really, um, it really showed how bad voice acting 
meshes with role playing games. Because in Morrowind, you know, each race has a male voice and a female voice, you know, a voice actor for each, one voice actor for each race. And that's fine. And in Morrowind, you, you barely notice it, you know, all the guards have the same voice, you know, that's fine. In Skyrim, it was unbearable. You know, you go to, <clears throat> you go to that first town and help the trader, and he has that really distinctive voice. And then you head over to Whiterun, walk into the first shop, and it's the same dude. He's got the same voice. And then you go do the Companions quest, and the main character in the Companions quest has the same voice. It's really disconcerting. Oh, yeah, and that was with, what was it, uh, 70 voice actors? And it's still incredibly noticeable? That's a big uh, That's a big problem right there. Yeah, I think it really comes down to RPG games, as we know them, are pretty much incompatible with the modern way of making games. I think that's what it comes down to. And I guess that's the uh, tagline that we're going to be going with this interview, is that voice acting is incompatible with role-playing games. So that's our takeaway here, folks. Well, luckily there's a huge um, indie game market that can make better games, you know. There are still good RPG games out there, they're just not being put out by the big studios. Oh yes, definitely. Though it's a bit hard to keep up with the uh, indie scene these days. It's like 500 games get released on Steam every month, practically. <laughs> yeah, and most of them are trash. But there's some there's some gems in there. Oh yes, definitely. And uh, we've kind of got off, gotten a bit off topic here with regards to our interview questions. Uh, so getting back to another uh, user submitted question here. This one is from Noel Cascade. Uh, how much hair do you have left after creating a large scale script mod that is v- vanilla? Without even using the Marlin Code patch and OpenMW compatible, uh, did you pull it all, you know, out, or did some of your hair remain? Um, it is a miracle that I'm not completely bald after coding in um, Morrowind script um, for that long. Um, like I said, I've gone days trying to fix simple bugs that in any other language in the world wouldn't be a problem. Um, I put it down to the fact that. In my day job as a software engineer, I actually work with a lot of legacy software, so I'm very used to very old, horrible code. So that's probably the only reason I've got any hair left. But uh, getting back to some of our uh, semi-more serious questions here, uh, have you been surprised by the extremely positive response to uh, Frostwind? Um, I honestly had no idea what to expect. Um, I hadn't been in the modern community for long, and you know, I spent so long working on this mod, I had no idea how the reaction was going to be. Um, but I'm I'm really happy with the response it has gotten, you know. Um, it's great to see other people enjoying the mod, even if I essentially made it for myself. Now, yeah, I've noticed that it is currently competing for one of the uh, top spots on the Nexus Hot Files, though Melkor has greedily uh, snatched up a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's hard to compete with, um, with graphics mods, because it's something that pretty much everyone who mods Morrowind wants, you know. No one's going to turn down an awesome, you know, m- mesh texture replacer for books. Whereas Frostwind is a, has a much more niche appeal. So it's a bit of a bit of an uphill battle trying to get to that top spot. Though I will say that you've been doing uh, surprisingly well. And not just you, uh, Noel Cascade with his sophisticated save system has gotten a lot more endorsements than oh, I think it would normally. I mean, gameplay mods don't usually get as much attention as graphics mods. Yeah, but I think the sophisticated saving isn't so much a gameplay mod as it is a um, saving us from the horribleness of Morrowind kind of mod. Um, similar with his Expedious Exit mod, you know. These are mods that everyone loves just because they help um, not get screwed over by Morrowind's bugginess, you know. Oh yes, uh, well, save games in particular, you know, those have always been a bit troublesome with Morrowind, because Morrowind does have a habit of corrupting uh, save games. Uh, I think there's something actually where an NPC might cast a spell, and uh, you die, and then try and load back up the save, like, right before that gets corrupt, and that is a bit of a hassle. Yeah, for sure. Um, Even with all of the patches and all of these nice, you know, mods to make things easier, you still get crashed to desktop. It's, it's going to be like that forever, I think. Which is why something like um, the Sophisticated Saving System is a much-needed mod for this game. I will say, though, that at least it's not as bad as Oblivion, which uh, still crashes to desktop all the time, even with uh, mods installed. <laughs> I haven't played Oblivion in a long time. Is it still that bad? 
Uh, it's gotten better. It no longer crashes the desktop every single time you close the game. But it still has major CTD issues, even with the, you know, Oblivion patches installed. Oh, it looks like Oblivion needs its own Expedius Exit mod. Yeah, quite possibly. And uh, speaking of, well, mod ideas, are you thinking of doing a whole new uh, needs mod? A more modern replacement for uh, Necessities of Morrowind or Bare Necessities? Yeah, this has been something um, I've been thinking about a lot, and a lot of people have asked me about, um, like in the Frostwind comments and on uh, Discord. Um, I don't think I would make anything as comprehensive as those mods. Um, like, I'm not sure which one it is, but they replace every single water mesh with a activator for you to fill up your water. Um, that just seems like way over the top, you know, um, for a needs mod, you know. Um, and the thing is, Frostwind actually has a, a basic um, hunger and sleep mechanic and that's through the well-fed and well-rested buffs that you get um, from cooking meals at a campfire or resting for more than six hours. And I much prefer that kind of um, positive reinforcement approach to um, to needs as opposed to, you know, oh, you haven't slept in this long, and now you're going to suffer. Or you've, you know, you haven't eaten this long, now you're dead. Um, I think that while it might be more realistic, it's less fun, you know. Um, but I do see more room for improvement on that aspect of Frostwind. So I might, in the future, introduce some um, some minor debuffs for sleeping and not eating, but nothing lethal, nothing really over the top. And I'm planning on adding more ways to cook food than just at a campfire, because right now you can only get the well-fed buff if you make a campfire. So if you rest you know, in a town, in an inn, you can't get that well-fed bonus unless you go outside and make a fire. So I'm... I'm tossing around ideas for other ways to get the well-fed bonus. Um, maybe inns should have a breakfast option when you talk to the innkeeper. Who knows? Well, I have to admit, I'm a bit surprised by that response, uh, you know, given that Frost, when, you know, kind of punishes you for uh, walking out in the rain too long, I was sort of expecting you to uh, be totally for that whole hunger and uh, thirst concept. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, but I've, I've found that with with food and water, it's... It, ends up boiling down to inventory management and I think that's what I don't like so much about it of you know just having to make sure you have the right number of items in your inventory or you'll die is a bit less fun but yeah I get your point maybe something a bit more brutal and unforgiving would be more suited for Frostwind oh yes as opposed to the inventory management of making sure you have uh, campfire materials and a tent with you and all that Oh, what's that, three items? It's not that hard to manage, although it does take up quite a bit of inventory space. Now, uh, looking down the uh, question list here, I think you've actually already answered this one because we've kind of been going out of order, but I'll go ahead and ask anyway. A lot of your mods are specifically immersion-based, adding immersive features like outdoor survival or drunkenness or allows you to create uh, vanilla game items like skooma or booze uh, that you couldn't do before. Uh, what draws you to making these particular type of immersion mods? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have pretty much answered this question. Um, it basically comes down to my interest is in increasing the freedom of the player and the reactivity of the world, you know. So um, so I make my mods to try and bring Morrowind closer to that Dungeons & Dragons feel of freedom, you know. Oh yeah, that was about what I expected you to say after you basically already answered it before. And, uh, well, you know, since it is that time of year again with uh, E3, and uh, the uh, Bethesda conference is going to be tomorrow, I think, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, theoretically, if you could design a Bethesda game from scratch, uh, uh, what more immersive features would you include? Um, I would include something like, um, you know, with uh, Fallout, Fallout 4 in in included a survival mode, um, well, they... they brought it in as a new new feature in a later patch of Fallout 4. And that that game made oh, that that feature made the game so much more fun for me. Um, with with survival mode in Fallout 4, it forced you to plan out your journey beforehand, you know? You'd have to pack your inventory with just the right stuff and then you'd have to plot out your quests, you know, what path you're gonna take um, to complete as many quests 
and after you know three or four days you're hungry and you're tired and you're irradiated and you finally come home to your settlement and that feeling of coming home was just awesome you know and you unload your gear and you drink some clean water and, and food and you know just unwind after a quest and that feeling is is something i really want to get um you know take to the extreme in an elder scrolls game so if i were to make my own um bethesda game i would take that survival mode to the extreme have you know no pre-rendered world map no fast travel you know realistic inventory weights hunger and thirst all that kind of thing just make it really um really tough you know like if you get a quest saying oh you got to go to this next town and talk to someone walking to that town should be an absolute mission you know and when you finally get to that town you should feel like you've really accomplished something ah sort of a uh, hearkening back to uh, what was it the uh the survival sim games only with uh, fantasy or fallout settings exactly something like the the long dark level of difficulty but completing you know fantasy quests in an rpg setting oh you know i actually didn't know that uh, fallout 4 had a survival option uh I usually play Fault New Vegas myself, and I know that one had some sort of a survival feature to it. Yeah, New Vegas had a pretty cool survival system. Um, yeah, they brought in the survival mode in Fallout 4, I think, a few months or like a year after it was released. And it, it changed up, you know, the... Uh, um, you could have things like you could only sleep in actual beds, and um, you know, things like radiation was way more brutal when you needed to eat and drink. So it's actually a really, really good addition to the game. Oh yeah, being forced to only uh, sleep in bed, that kind of sounds like a uh, concept for another immersion mod right there. Oh yeah, my realistic sleep mod. Um, I actually built Frostwind out of the realistic sleep mod, and then got rid of the actual feature of realistic sleep, because I didn't actually like it. <laughs> oh, well that's, uh, that's kind of surprising. Yeah, well I, f I figured that, because the realistic sleep mod for me was, I want a way of making... Um, of forcing myself when I'm playing the game to follow a more realistic pattern, you know, of actually going to sleep in a bed. And the realistic sleep mod was my first kind of hacky attempt at it, where if you if you don't sleep in a bed, it just wakes you up. Um, and Frostwind is actually a natural progression of that because all of those weather mechanics and all that crazy stuff really boils down to making you sleep in a bed when you should, you know, sleep in a bed at night. And I just do that in a roundabout way by making nights really cold. Oh, and that sort of uh, makes sense. And, you know, I just, I have to mention this. It does seem to be an interesting concept, you know, with the whole Frostwind thing. Is, uh, you know, having to deal with frost and hypothermia on a volcanic island. It's not really something you'd expect. <laughs> yeah, that has been pointed out to me. That I probably should have made Ashfall instead of Frostwind and added all the heat mechanics. And that is actually another feature I'm planning to add in the future um, of adding, you know, heat mechanics. And if you stand too close to lava, you get, you know, heat stroke and things like that. Um, the thing that's making me procrastinate from doing that um, is the fact that it would require rebalancing all of the exposure mechanics and everything, because now you have um, going in the other direction as well. So that would require quite a lot of rewriting code. Oh yes, and after you uh, almost lost all your hair to it already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but in defense of Frostwind and its cold weather mechanics, you will notice that um, the Ashlanders and that that you know are in the, out in the wilderness, they were all standing by campfires, so it does get cold in Vardenfell. We can say that at least. Oh yes, and uh, that makes sense, at least at night anyway. I mean, it even gets cold out in a desert, so we would expect that. Yeah, exactly. And I might do a bit more balancing around Frostwind's, you know, regional effects. Because right now, I've found some areas are um, a bit colder than they probably should be. Uh, you know, I did want to ask, did you ever take a look at, uh, I think it was uh, Zapera's uh, Temperature Mod from like uh, about 2004-2005, uh, which had uh, both cold and heat mechanics in it? Uh, I haven't looked at it yet, but it's one of the mods that I need to take a look at so I can steal ideas. I mean, take inspiration from. Oh yes, of course, of course. Just inspiration, nothing else. Definitely just inspiration. And maybe some meshes as well. Oh yes, I, uh, since you mentioned it, I did notice that you've updated uh, Frostwind with, I think that's a new tent mesh? Yeah, um, that's a tent uh, made by Melchior Dark for the Caldera Mine expansion. And, um, and it just 
it looks amazing and it fits perfectly with Frostwind. And it wasn't actually too hard to add to the game either. I just had to hack together the tent code with the bedroll code, and now you've got a bedroll that acts a little bit like a tent. Oh yeah, it looks uh, pretty good integrated in the game. And uh, well, sort of going back to our list of questions here, uh, have you ever considered branching out into other types of mods, like dungeon or quest mods, that perhaps integrate some of your uh, survival features here? Um, I've never tried anything like dungeon mods before. Um, you know, as a, as a software engineer by trade, I prefer mods that uh, you know rely mostly on scripting because that's what I'm good at. Um, but I could, you know, it's definitely um, possible. I could get into some quest mods at least. Oh gosh, I can't believe we're doing two of these coder interviews in a row. It's like uh, it's basically the same response as Noel Cascade last week. <laughs> yeah, I think he might be a better coder than me though. I mean, he when he makes his mods, he actually creates the functions he needs and. Um, the script extender and then uses them in his mods. It's sort of cheating if you ask me. Uh, do you have any big plans for mods outside of Frostwind? Uh, perhaps a more modern take on modern crafting or are there some uh, small mods that you're planning to do next? Um, well I've got a massive massive list of features that are in the works for Frostwind so that's going to take most of my time for the foreseeable future. Um, but I do have um, ideas for other mods when I eventually have some time for it. Um, I'm sp specifically I'm interested in mods that would enhance a a hunter survival st style playthrough. You know, obviously because with Frostwind that's the kind of playthrough I'd be interested in um, and would work well with it. So one idea I've got um, kind of kicking around is a monster style uh, monster hunter style mod where you're given a quest to hunt down a legendary creature out in the wild, and then you come back and maybe you can craft a powerful weapon or armor from its bones or its hide. Um, so yeah, something like that, maybe down the road. Oh yeah, I think there's been a few attempts at that idea in the uh, Marlin Modern community in the past, including, uh, actually, uh, someone re-uploaded it to the Nexus, I think? Uh, Mythical Hunters or something? Uh, yeah, I saw that one. Um, hopefully I can do a better job <laughs> of making a, a mod more sort of integrated and immersive. Oh yeah, obviously it's a bit on the uh, dated side. Yeah, again with with our new script extenders and stuff coming out, it um it opens a lot of doors for, um, for things like randomization and you know being able to place creatures and items where you where you want without um, making cell edits stuff like that will make it a lot easier. So if I do a mod like that, it'll almost certainly be using the script extender. Oh yes, and it is a rather exciting time in the community that all these uh, new possibilities are just now sort of opening up. Yeah, for sure, and there's been some awesome mods come out of it already. Now, uh, since you did participate in uh, this year's Marathon, uh, do you have any plans to participate in this year's, you know, Modern Modding Madness uh, team-based modding competition, uh, starting October 1st? Yeah, I'll definitely be keen. Yeah, if anyone needs a uh, expert in Morrowind script, and vanilla Morrowind scripting, then yeah, hit me up. Well, that'll certainly uh, be a rather interesting addition. Uh, uh, Noel Cascade actually uh, passed that down, so uh, you'll be one of the only uh, big scripters in uh, this year's competition, maybe. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay then. Well, of course, assuming uh, Greatness 7 doesn't uh, jump back in again anyway. Yeah, that's true. And if he does, then he might have a better shot at taking the competition away. Uh, his team does historically win, so uh, someone needs to knock him off the throne. Well, I'm up to the challenge. Now, uh, going on to uh, some more uh, general modding questions, uh, do you have any planning uh, that you do before you start a mod, and uh, if yes, how? Uh, when I first start a mod, I have no planning whatsoever. I tend to just jump straight into the construction kit and see whether my idea would actually work and, you know, experiment and try things out. Um, but once I have an idea and once I have a starting point, um, then the first thing I do is I write a checklist of features and I m maintain that checklist throughout the development and whenever you know I release a um, whenever I finish a feature I tick it off and then as I come up with new bugs and features that I find um, I add them to the list and so I think Frostwind I think I've got about like a hundred um, items ticked off and about 12 still active on my checklist Oh yeah, I imagine that was a pretty hard mod to a uh, bug test, really. Yeah, very difficult, especially trying to um, 
test the balance you know okay I need, now I need to get a character who's level 20 and is doing a soul slime quest or now I'm a Nord who's level 5 you know or an Argonian who uh, lives in soul slime for some reason <laughs> yeah I haven't tested that one maybe it's completely out of balance and uh, now have you been inspired by any other modders in the community or you know been influenced by them in some way and if so what was it about the work that uh, inspired you um, well, I have to say that Null Cascade has inspired me into considering the Morrowind script extender for my future mods. Uh, the stuff he and Greatness have, have done with um, with the new script extender is just amazing. Oh yeah, I saw on uh, Discord that he was uh, kind of pushing you uh, really hard to uh, use MWSC. <laughs> yeah, they bring it up at every possible moment. Now, uh, sort of on a similar token here, uh, how do you keep yourself motivated when modding or, you know, scripting with those long lines of code for uh, Frostwind? Um, I don't know if I would call it motivation. I think it's more of an addiction, really. <laughs> you just sort of get into a, a, uh, a, a, just a trance, basically. I don't know why I'm motivated to do it, but I spend all day at work, you know, kind of on Discord on one of my screens, and then I come home and I'm just just keen to to get modding well there does sound like there's an awful lot of parallels here between you and the null cascade interview which of course you haven't heard yet because it doesn't air until tomorrow but I, you should listen to that because he's basically the exact same <laughs> well you should release my one first so that it looks like he's copying off me now yeah, well that is the trouble for recording these interviews it takes so long to edit them that uh by the time they air it's like it's been a couple of weeks already <laughs> oh well that's fine then he can get the credit. And now if you could uh, make a single change to the uh, capabilities of the construction set, uh, what would it be exactly? Um, I'm sure this was Null Cascade's answer as well, but I would give it the ability to actually compile scripts properly. Oh, well, that was actually not his answer because he doesn't use the construction set because he just does everything in Lua, so... Aha! <laughs> oh, that's true. That's a very good point. But uh, yes, out of the 30-some interviews I've conducted, the Marlin script compiler comes up more than a few times here. Yeah, well, it takes up about 90% of a scripter's time, I think, fighting against the compiler. I mean, it's barely even really a compiler. It never tells you uh, what's wrong, really, practically. You just have to do, like, guesswork constantly. Yeah, I used to, um, I used to make mods and only test them in Open Morrowind, and then when I completed the mod, I would then try and run it in vanilla Morrowind and it would all break and I would spend the next two weeks fixing all of the bugs that I didn't know existed. And that's another weird thing, right? Because uh, some bugs that open in Morrowind will detect won't be detected by Morrowind, which is kind of weird. Yeah, open Morrowind is unusually strict about things that the original game doesn't care about. Like, um, one thing is implicit references, like if you go play sound and then don't give it an implicit reference. Vanilla Morrowind will go, oh, you want the object the script is attached to to play the sound. And Open Morrowind, it'll be, it'll give you a big warning saying, hey, there's no, you know, there's no explicit reference for this core. And that reminds me that I should probably actually uh, check a bunch of my mods to make sure that they work with OpenMW because I still haven't done that yet. No, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, just explosions everywhere. The game crashes. The computer overheats. Catches fire. It's not a problem. Well, if that helps convince people to move back to vanilla and the script extender, then maybe it's a good thing. Oh yes, I've been meaning to ask. Uh, you're one of the uh, modders out there that's uh, been pretty adamant about OpenMW uh, compatibility and making sure your mods work with it. Are you sort of switching back to uh, vanilla Morrowind and MWC now? Yeah, um, I used to be all about Open Morrowind, and I played um, I played through the game quite a bit with it uh, recently. Um, and the reason I was for Open Morrowind because, you know, a few years and years ago when I first heard about it, the prevailing opinion was that Vanilla Morrowind has a bunch of stuff that you can't dehard code. The engine will not allow you to get certain information out, and so modding capability is limited. And so the only option is to rewrite the engine. And that made sense, and, and so Open Morrowind was a good idea. And then you know, I come back a few years later and Open Morrowind's basically finished and it's playable. So I thought that it really was the best way forward. Um, but recently, you know, with the work that's been going on with Lua scripting and Morrowind script extender, it's just not true anymore. The stuff that um, Null is 
dehard coating from the vanilla engine. It's just, I don't know how he does it, it's amazing. And it seems like it's making Open Morrowind almost obsolete. I mean, there's still things it's good for, but the stuff that I wanted it for is actually script extenders doing a much better job of it. Oh yes, and it's kind of a weird time in the community uh, at, at the same time here, right? Because, I mean, you got OpenMW, it's doing some pretty impressive work, then you got MWC just coming out of the blue and doing even cooler things, and of course uh, you still got updates to the modern graphics extender with, you know, that whole physical-based rendering stuff, and uh, none of this stuff is really compatible for uh, one another, so you've got a lot of, you know, a split with modders, you know, which uh, direction do you want to go? Yeah, and I think with Open Morrowind, um, it seems their plan is, first stage is to try and get it completely, you know, like vanilla first, and then you can go off and start adding all the cool stuff that they've been talking about doing for so long. And when that happens, maybe maybe I'll switch back to Open Morrowind, who knows? I mean, having an open source engine does open up a lot of stuff. Um, but right now, if you look at the two, it's the clear winner is Script Extender. I mean, you can do stuff in the Script Extender that you just can't do with Open Morrowind. And other than, you know, operating system compatibility and a few other things, Open Morrowind right now doesn't have really that much more in the way of um, opening up modding abilities. Other than, of course, you know, the whole uh, multiplayer aspect. Oh yeah, I haven't tried the multiplayer yet, but that is pretty awesome. But uh, anyway, we've sort of gotten off topic here again, but uh, uh, getting back to all of this, the questions. Uh, how much do you use the uh, community to get feedback and motivation for your mods? Um, a lot. Yeah, the community is great for this, um, for more and modding. Uh, I spend far too much time on the modding Discord, and I will take any chance I can get to watch other people play my mods. Um, it's really important for me to see other people play it, because other players tend to catch things that I wouldn't notice, because I'm so used to the mod and I know how it all works. So yeah, I spend a lot of time um, getting feedback from the community. Oh yeah, and that probably helps with the uh, different playstyles as well, because as you mentioned before, like testing it for balance, uh, you know, uh, if you're, you know, used to playing a particular type of character, it is pretty hard to just play that type of character and forget to actually test the mod with other types of characters. Yeah, and not just characters, but the, the way people play the game is completely different too, you know? And things that I might find um, to be, you know, enjoyable, other people might find annoying, you know? So it's good to see other people playing it and what they find intuitive and what they find enjoyable. Oh yeah, and well, going back to that whole different characters thing, I, I mentioned that because uh, even I, as a dungeon and quest modder, sort of ran into that problem before, uh, because I always, you know, play Dark Elf, because I'm Dark Elf guy, and I, in one of my dungeon mods, actually, it's like uh, someone played as an Altma, and they're taller, you know, and uh, found out that their characters actually, uh, sort of, uh, the uh, dungeon layout was, didn't, the ceiling height wasn't high enough, so their heads just glitched right through the top of the ceiling of the dungeon, and yeah, sometimes you just need to play around a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's um, one issue that I, fortunately, I was um, I actually thought of that when I'm making my tent mesh for Frostwind. I thought, okay, I'd better test this with a high elf because then he might not be able to fit inside this thing. Oh yeah, that that's something I always forget to do is to test for the tall races at Tario. I always forget there is just so many different sizes. It's a good thing I don't test everything with a Bosma. Yeah, well, Bethesda caught on to that, and that's why every race is almost identical looking in um, Elder Scrolls Online now. They're all just humans with different looking faces. Oh, yeah, I try to, you know, forget about that whole ESO phase. I actually kind of enjoyed the game. I thought it was alright mechanics-wise, especially for an MMO. Uh, but yeah, I just the, the way they just butchered the visuals and the lore is just it's kind of sad. Yeah, I played the game. It's a fun MMO. It's got a lot going for it in the, you know, just fun department. But as far as lore goes, I mean, it's... That's the problem I have with ESO. They took something I love and kind of butchered it. But they did it in a fun way, but they still butchered something I loved. <laughs> yeah, although to be fair, um, they've been doing that since the beginning. Like, if you look at the Khajiit, in the original Elder, Elder Scrolls 1, Khajiit were people who put, you know, face paint on to look like cats. So they've been messing with the lore for a long time. 
Oh yeah, that's true, but we all know that the lore didn't really start until Morrowind, and also stopped at Morrowind. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But anyway, are there any uh, skills you've learned from modding, and uh, if so, have you been able to use those skills elsewhere? And uh, since you mentioned that you were a uh, software engineer, uh, maybe it's the uh, reverse. Are there any skills that you've learned on the job that have been useful for uh, modding Morrowind? Um, well, yeah, being a software engineer has obviously um, made the job of learning scripting a lot easier. Um, in terms of what I've learned from modding Morrowind, um, when, when you're writing something, writing code in something as finicky and horrible as Morrowind script, um, it forces you to make your code consistent and human readable, you know, because if you make a mistake, you're going to spend hours tracking down the bug. So I've actually learned quite a lot in terms of making my code very clear and consistent. And it's also taught me a great deal of patience, you know. I now have a great deal of experience in, um, in patiently working through bugs for many, many, many hours. Well, really, I think that's something that's required in modern modding period is uh, patience. Uh, after all the saying goes, everything will be released in 2090. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, it definitely has helped. Um, it has transferred into my day job as well. You know, I actually have learned more consistent coding um, that I use in my day job. So something good actually came out of the terrible Morrowind scripting language? That's, that is surprising. That is remarkable, right? Now, uh, sort of going on to this next question here, uh, do you have a mod that hasn't received enough acclaim as you think it should have? And if so, which one and why? Well, the, the most fun I've had with my own mods has come from um, my immersive alcohol mod. And that's the one where, you know, you can get drunk and you get addicted to alcohol and you get the hiccups and withdrawal symptoms and all that kind of thing. And I've, I just enjoy it so much every time I get drunk in the game, just from, you know, I'll just do it occasionally just for the fun of it. And it's it doesn't impact your playstyle or game much other than just adding a bit of silly immersion, you know? And I love it so much, and I'm surprised it didn't get as much attention as I thought it would. Because um, I was under the impression that there was a bit of a demand out there for some alcohol mechanics. Um, so maybe I just didn't advertise the mod enough, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, that is kind of surprising, especially with how well Frostwind is doing right now. Yeah, it is strange. Um, so I even added a uh, compatibility with that mod in Frostwind, where if you drink alcohol with immersive alcohol activated, that actually warms you up in Frostwind. So I'm, I'm actually uh, adding other things to new mods to try and bring attention to immersive alcohol. Oh yes, I did notice that. Uh, perhaps we just need to do a video showcase of uh, immersive alcohol at some point. I know we haven't uh, done one quite yet. Yeah, that would be great. Looking forward to it. Now, I do have just a few more questions here, and uh, the next one here is, uh, what mods and modders currently have your attention in the community? Well, there's a couple of people working on retextures for the Better Bodies mod, which I'm really excited about, because we all pretty much rely on Better Bodies, because so many other of my, uh, mods rely on it, and the texture for Better Bodies just clashes with every other texture mod I have. So, having a more vanilla-friendly retexture for Better Bodies is going to be awesome. Oh yeah, uh, who is that? Is that, uh, is that Henrik or Gvolt or Stav Rogan? Honestly, I have a hard time keeping up with his names. <laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, Heinrich, I think. Now, uh, are there any mods that you look at and think, uh, I wish I made that? Uh, well, I felt that way about Frostfall, so I went ahead and made my own version of it in Morrowind. Well, I suppose that's uh, one way of doing it. Yeah, um, I don't know if there's any mods in Morrowind that I wish I made, because um, I know how horrible it is making mods, so I'm kind of glad that other people make all the awesome mods that I haven't made. Oh well, uh, fair enough, and uh, moving on to our final batch of questions here, uh, what do you think about the other Elder Scrolls games like Oblivion, uh, Skyrim, and the Elder Scrolls Online, even though we kind of covered those a bit already? Yeah, um, I mean I kind of enjoy all the Elder Scrolls games, um, even though it's fun to nitpick and criticize them. Um, Oblivion has some awesome stuff and some of the quest lines are some of the best, you know, in all the Elder Scrolls games, like the Dark Brotherhood quests. But it did so much wrong in terms of some of the mechanics and graphics and stuff that it just hasn't aged well, you know? I don't know if I could really get back into it. It just, it just looks awful no matter what you do to it. Uh, 
Skyrim. I I hate Skyrim from a game design perspective. It's just not an RPG. And people say, oh well, you know, it's it's you play it for the story, but the writing in Skyrim is terrible as well. And without mods, there's not really much replayability. Um, but it can be fun if you mod the hell out of Skyrim and just mods and mods and mods to completely overhaul all the bad mechanics. It can be kind of fun. And yeah, I've covered ESO already. That I've played it a bit, quite enjoyed it, but I didn't like the, what they've done to the lore. Oh yeah, uh, speaking of Skyrim, I think the one thing that I like about Skyrim is, well, you know, stealth with archery, you know. It is fun to pick off some enemies, but then, of course, you get to the boss of each dungeon, which is just a giant hit pool, and then the fun sort of goes right out the window. Yes, stealth archer is fun, but it's so badly balanced, and how many people have said they, you know, always accidentally become a stealth archer, just because the way the mechanics are built, it's just so overpowered you end up doing it. Um, And so many times I've quit a, a playthrough, quit the game because I've hit some arbitrary level where all the monsters, all the enemies become way more powerful and suddenly my stealth kills don't hit them in one go anymore and they can one hit kill me. So I have to stop playing because it's not fun anymore. Oh yeah, so I think both Oblivion and Skyrim really have major balancing issues. I mean, I've heard a bunch of people say that Morrowind has balancing issues, but I don't really see it as much as with Oblivion and Skyrim. I mean, yes, in Morrowind you can eventually become a god, but that's kind of the fun, really. Well, I think Morrowind's... Um, the, the, the way that Morrowind is so... It's so easy to become overpowered, and how much freedom it gives, actually makes the balancing better, because it allows you to adjust your playstyle to make it challenging. Whereas with Oblivion and Skyrim, they tried so hard to hold your hand and make everything just the right level and everything just perfect and each playstyle is just difficult enough that you're on this very narrow kind of path of difficulty. And the moment something doesn't quite go the way the developers expected it to go, um, you find yourself getting one hit killed, you know? Whereas in Morrowind, if you find yourself getting one hit killed, you can go and make yourself a super powerful potion to give you a million strength, you know? You can always rebalance it yourself in Morrowind. Oh yes, and that openness about Morrowind is one of the things that the Elder Scrolls series has kind of lost, really, is the open-ended possibilities of doing just about anything. I mean, Morrowind's enchantment and spellmaking and alchemy systems were pretty open-ended, sometimes unbalanced, but, you know, it gave a lot of creative freedom to the player. Yeah, and I, I honestly feel like with Skyrim, the developers wanted that stuff, and I feel like it was taken out because of this misguided idea of trying to balance it. Because I remember before Skyrim came out, um, they were talking about all the great new stuff that was going to be in it, and one thing they said was, oh, you can have... You can have, with our jewel casting thing, you can have a spell in each hand, and you combine the spells to create unique effects, you know? And then when the game came out, that ended up, well, if you have fire in your left hand and fire in your right hand, you have more fire. So you can tell they were they wanted some complex mechanics, but the game that came out, it was all nerfed completely until it was just boring. Yeah, and, you know, that kind of makes me wonder, you know, uh, whether or not a modern audience uh, would really embrace, you know, a more player-creative freedom sort of game like Morrowind today if it was done in a more, you know, sort of modern uh, style of graphics. I mean, obviously, a lot of these games have been dumbed down for a larger, wider, modern audience, but would a modern audience actually appreciate a game that's, uh, you know, sort of more creatively freedom-based? I mean, uh, you, we've kind of seen that with uh, Divinity Original Sin, which was a pretty big success, I think, and has a lot of that uh, player creative freedom. Yeah, I mean, there is there's definitely a market out there for um, for games that don't hold your hand and really do have deep RPG mechanics. And things like um, uh, Pillar of, Pillars of Eternity as well is a really great game for that. Um, so there's a market out there. I think it's just a question of, is the market big enough for these these big studios to bother with, you know? Yeah, and that's the thing I keep asking myself, is if Morrowind was made today, would it sell 7 million copies in, like, a weekend, like Skyrim did? 
or would it not? I mean, Morrowind was a pretty big uh, uh, block seller, really, when it came out in the early 2000s. It sold over 3 million copies in the first couple of years, and that was a big deal at the time. But would it still be able to hold up today? Yeah, I don't think it... I think it would be as popular as something like Divinity, Original Sin. But you see today, the reason Skyrim is so popular is because the gaming community... When Morrowind came out, the gaming community was full of gamers, you know, who were really into gaming. And now the gaming community has... It still has those people, but it's also got a huge amount of... I guess you call them casual gamers. And... And... You know, it's fine to be a casual gamer, and what they want is a nice, easy, you know, easy to get into, um, you know, not too much effort to have fun in the game kind of thing. And Skyrim appeals to that group very well, in the same way that, you know, games like Call of Duty or, you know, Assassin's Creed, games like that appeal to. Oh, yes, and, well, I guess, sort of getting back on topic here... Uh, what do you think makes, well, the Morrowind modding community so vibrant after more than 15 years? Um, I think it comes down to the fact that Morrowind was the last great RPG game. Um, I mean, okay, there's been some really good ones recently, but nothing with the scope and size that Morrowind had, because it was the last game where a pretty big company, a big gaming studio, um, went ahead and made a game like that. Um, so I think we can thank Bethesda for not releasing a better game in 16 years. So those of us who love those kind of open world games with the RPG mechanics, all we can do is just keep improving Morrowind. Ah yes, and uh, who knows, maybe one day we'll make Morrowind, uh, you know, graphically and immersively even better than a Skyrim is with mods. Well, I think already Morrowind looks nicer than modded Skyrim, um, just because of the, the world that you're working with initially is just so much more beautiful so if you mod the hell out of Morrowind um, you can get it looking this better looking than Skyrim ever will ever be because Skyrim you're working with a kind of boring you know snowy plains and you can never get that looking quite as great oh yeah I definitely think that Morrowind had better you know art design and direction than the later games especially Oblivion I mean let's face it Oblivion didn't really have any art design and direction they just went with Medieval fantasy, and uh, let's throw in a bit of Lord of the Rings just for good measure. Yeah, and this it's a something I really don't understand about their decisions in these later games. You know, you're not, not going to alienate people by making your world look, you know, really weird and awesome. You know, no no one says, oh, I don't like the giant mushrooms in Morrowind. That kind of design is just objectively awesome. You know. And yet they, maybe it was just laziness, but I don't understand why Oblivion was just bland green fields and Skyrim was just as boring. Uh, it could have been, you know, like that technology limitation, because uh, Cyrodiil was originally supposed to be like endless jungle, is how it was described. And, oh gosh, that was at around the time, you know, 2006, that uh, uh, jungle spread technology wasn't that great. Uh, like, Far Cry 2 actually managed it pretty well, but uh, I don't think that came out for another year or two afterwards. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. But, I mean, having less trees doesn't quite explain the rest of how bland it is, you know? Why not make the trees look cooler, you know? Why not have the creatures look cooler instead of fighting goblins? I mean, what is more generic than a goblin? It's uh, really hard to imagine, though... I guess I would say wolves and bears are pretty generic as well. Yeah, that's true. Or bandits, like in uh, Fallout. What are they called? Uh, what are the bandits called in Fallout? I think Fallout 4, they're all um, scavengers, I think. But, you know, all the enemies are basically the same, you know, scavenger, outlaw kind of things. Oh, yes, it's uh, definitely quite different from Morrowind's uh, Nyx Hounds and... Elites and Kagutis, which are all these just incredibly strange looking creatures that everyone just treats as normal because that's normal for that world. Yeah, exactly. And then you have Elder Scrolls Online, which made all of those look way more boring. Well, oh, speaking of pet peeves, I really hate what they did to, you know, Kwama, uh, those Kwama insects and scribs and all that because they really just messed up the design there. Yeah, like, why would you get rid of the unique design of the whole Kwama 
nest you know system like it was so weird and wonderful having you know the uh the foragers um crawl into the workers and then become a, a kwama hunter or however it works yeah that was one of the really strange and bizarre things that you just eventually accept as normal after you've played Morrowind for a really long time? Yeah, well that's because the design is all so well integrated and it just all fits. It just, it feels like it belongs in the world. Uh, which is uh, maybe another problem with like Oblivion, Skyrim and ESO is that uh, maybe they just don't have as much uh, good, you know, weird uh, world consistency. It's like, not just the fact that they're not as weird, but also the fact that the worlds are not perhaps as consistent with, you know, how everything is integrated. Yeah, and that's one thing Skyrim did well, you have to admit, is that the world they made, even though it's kind of boring, it, it is um, quite consistent and has, has a good um, good theme to it. I uh, do kind of like the uh, design of those uh, Nordic barrows, but luckily uh, Skyrim Home of the Nords has sort of copied that, so uh, you don't need to play Skyrim in order to experience those anymore. Yeah, with the way Morrowind modding is going, we won't need to play any later Elder Scrolls games. As it should be. Now, uh, do you think there's anything the uh, Morrowind modding community should be doing in order to continue to expand and grow in the coming years? Oh, I'm not sure. I think you're doing a pretty good job putting out videos and advertising what we're doing in, in the modding community. Um, but I think a lot of people still don't know just how much progress we've made, you know? I don't think, um, you know, the wider gaming community realise that Morrowind modding has improved the game unbelievably, you know? So maybe it would be good to have some video showcases that just show off all of the modding capability we have all at once and, you know, demonstrate what a heavily modded Morrowind game can be like and target that towards people who haven't played in a long time. Oh gosh, I don't think my computer could actually handle that, but if someone could do that, that would be uh, pretty fantastic. Yeah, well it doesn't have to be you, there's plenty of other people making videos, I'm sure we could get it done. Oh yeah, are you uh, volunteering? <laughs> I don't have a streaming setup, but yeah, maybe, maybe in the future. Well, just let me know when you do, and uh, we can uh, plug you on the channel then. And uh, you know, regarding sort of the uh, wider you know gaming community, another thing I'd like to point out here is that uh, you know modders should advertise on the Steam forums, which everyone forgets that there is a Steam forums, but uh, the Marwin discussion boards are actually one of the more active forum boards in the realm of Morrowind forum boards out there. So, you know, you have Bethesda.net, USP, all these other places, but the Morrowind Steam forums are one of the more active ones, and usually uh, they have a lot of Morrowind players on there and not necessarily Morrowind modders or even people who are aware of the modding community. And they do also have a bit of a troll problem. There's just a bunch of troll threads about how awful Morrowind is on there, so it would be great if we could just wipe those out with a bunch of, you know, mod release threads instead. Oh, that's a good idea. I haven't actually been on the Steam forums. But yeah, you'd, the only way to deal with trolls is to be more active than they are. Exactly. Uh, trust me, if you go on there, just don't read any of the uh, discussing the flaws of Morrowind threads or anything. It'll make your veins pop out from anger. And that's sort of the reaction they're going for. Oh, I think it's a bunch of Skyrim players who are jealous at how awesome our game is. Oh yes, clearly. And uh, is there any advice that you'd like to uh, give to budding new Moran modders out there looking to release their uh, first mod? Yeah, well the way I got started was, like I said, um, trying to bug fix someone else's mod. And starting off with, you know, messing around in another mod is a great way to see how other people do it. And doing that taught me a lot that would have taken me forever to try and learn from scratch, you know. So if you really, if it's the first time you're getting into modding, I would download a mod that's similar to what you want to do and just have a play around with it um, and my other advice would be start small and remember to ask for help when you need it the modding discord is really good for that um, I've gotten a lot of good advice from there I wish I knew about it when I first started modding oh yeah that is a really good advice uh, I don't think I've actually mentioned this before but uh, how I got started in quest modding was I actually downloaded a couple of other uh, quest mods and sort of, you know, backward engineered how to make quests from that and that's how I really got into quest modding. Uh, you know, just uh, checking out some other people's mods under the hood in the CS is a 
pretty big boon to trying to uh, figure out how to do it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. There's no point reinventing the wheel. Um, if other people have done what you want to do, see how they did it. Oh yes, definitely. And uh, finally, is there anyone in the community you'd like to uh, give a shout out to? Uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank Rubber Man. Um, he helped me a lot with uh, meshes when I was first making Frostwind. And he was the first one um, who ever reached out to help me with Frostwind before I knew about the modding Discord. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Null and Greatness because I've been a huge help with scripting um, uh, recently. And thanks to Danae for giving me the exposure to Frostwind and Bardic Inspiration. Um, when I when I released Bardic Inspiration, you know, my first mod, um, she was the first one to sort of make a video about it and give it its exposure. And finally, I'd like to thank you, because um, the work you put into your videos and organizing these competitions is just so essential to keeping this modern community alive. Yeah, well, thank you, and uh, thank you for agreeing to do this interview. If we didn't have modders like you, you know, agree to sign up for these things, uh, well, this series would be pretty much dead in the water. No worries, it's been great fun, and thanks for having me.